This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. The airlift was a masterpiece of improvisation, not a calculated policy. Scholars have assumed that one decision was made at the start. But the decision to begin an airlift was not a decision to begin the airlift, as we understand that term, and scholars have confused the two. The British and Americans started sending supplies not to break the blockade, but to stretch stocks for as long as possible, in the hope that diplomacy would resolve the crisis in the meantime. Yet the odds were against the diplomats. The West remained committed to creating a separate West German government, while Stalin made it clear that abandoning that project was his price for lifting the blockade. The best Western officials could hope for appeared to be open-ended deadlock, perpetual blockade, and perpetual airlift, something Berliners could not endure forever. Nor could contemporaries rule out the possibility that Stalin might forcibly disrupt the airlift. Today we regard the airlift as a virtually risk-free path to success. They could not. Strategy reconciles ends and means. In that sense, the West had no strategy, no policy that offered a reasonable prospect of producing a favorable outcome. Diplomatic historians and political scientists have treated the airlift as a conscious strategy for several reasons. One is hindsight. The airlift succeeded. Another is the influence of decision-making models. In offering simple outlines of choices and courses of action, these models have predisposed scholars to detect a pattern of behavior during the blockade that did not exist. Third, scholars have not examined the details of implementation, concentrating instead on policy deliberations and decision-making. Logistics seem mundane. To understand the airlift's place in Western policy, we must examine how it grew, over weeks and months, into the full-scale, organized effort that some believed existed from the start. Dismissing doubts about the airlift obscures important aspects of Western diplomacy, particularly coalition unity. The powers found it hard to stay in step in at least three key moments during the crisis. Doubts about the airlift were one cause. Europeans feared the Americans wanted to bring the crisis to a head, a step likely to trigger war. We tend to see Europeans' worries as exaggerated, believing that Truman had overruled the most dangerous proposal put forward during the crisis, Clay's convoy plan but American officials regarded the airlift as the prelude to Clay's armored column, not an alternative to it. When the airlift failed, which some expected as early as October, the West would face a choice between withdrawing from Berlin and challenging the blockade with Clay's tanks. Western Europeans were relying on American power to prevent a war with the Soviet Union, not prevail in one. With no ocean between them and the Red Army, Europeans understandably dwelled more on the likelihood and consequences of war than Americans did. They were more willing to let diplomacy spin out and less willing to gamble on the airlift than Americans were. Diplomatic efforts to deal with Berlin continued after the Soviets lifted the blockade on May 12, 1949. Foreign ministers met in Paris on May 23rd and agreed to disagree, bringing this Berlin crisis to a close. Stalin had suffered a serious defeat. He had failed to derail the West German government. He had not captured Berlin. The blockade had alienated Western public opinion, strengthened anti-communist sentiment in Germany, and hastened the North Atlantic alliance. In the West, the only lessons learned seemed to be hard-line ones. The blockade fixed in the public's mind an image of the Soviet Union as an aggressive, expansionist, and ruthless totalitarian state. The most dangerous times during the crisis had come during negotiations. The only safe course was to build positions of strength. Other lessons could have been derived from the blockade. Although firmness and resolve defeated Stalin, Western diplomacy succeeded because of other virtues too. Above all, prudence and a refusal to rush to judgment. Western leaders chose to cross bridges when they came to them, not before. In postponing choice, they unwittingly gave the airlift time to prove itself. None of this was conscious or deliberate or even intuitive. As he drifted, Truman could not acknowledge what he was doing. Instead, he reassured himself with tough declarations about staying period and not passing the buck. Declarations historians have accepted at face value ever since. The Western policy of avoiding long-term choices seemed illogical well into the autumn of 1948, and it was never the model of rationality some scholars describe. In the end, results proved its wisdom, if not its logical consistency. The policy worked.